Hi all. Let's continue looking at the evolution of style series and look at another attractive win from Alexander Alagain or Eliakin. Okay. This was against Aaron Nimzovich, 1930. Of course, we know uh, Nimzovich was one of the leading hypermodernists, so I thought it was quite kind of appropriate that our previous Alagain game was against Retty, Richard Retty. And this one is now against Nimzovich. So how did he duff up the hypermoderns? Okay, in this game he had the luxury of the white pieces. He played e4, and Nimzovich responded with the French defence. Okay, the e6 move, you'll note already has an indication it's weakening dark squares. As soon as this one comes to d5, you weaken even more dark squares. Now the significance of d6 comes later, quite interestingly, um, from a very interesting variation, which I read about years ago uh, from a Timan book. And the guy that wrote the Timan book was an international master, Ravi Kumar, who was actually helping Andrew Martin do the British commentary uh, this year and the previous year. Very, very interesting idea to exploit the dark squares in this variation, which which I don't usually employ myself, but it's worth making a note of. Okay, so d4, d5, not unusual so far. Now we have the choice here between the Tarash and like the mainline winnower, the two main choices. Knight c3 was played, so we have a pin. Um, now from a stylistic, you know, fundamental concept perspective, there's a certain immobility uh, around pins, which Nimzovich kind of categorized, you know, pins both as tactical and strategical. Um, the immobility angle can be considered, I think, strategical, because if your opponent is pinned, then you're gaining, you know, positional security. So in a way, maybe that's part of prophylaxis. If the opponent's like restrained, blockaded or pinned, it's all part of positional security, which can be considered part of prof prophylaxis, which can be you know, part of this idea that in the art of war, you put yourself beyond defeat before going on to the attack. Now I emphasize the pin here because we're going to see another pin later on, not on C3, but on C6. So watch out for that as well. There's going to be an almighty one coming up in this game. But uh, the first thing which I, I re introduced before, this, this weakness of these dark squares, this is fascinating what's about to happen. White plays e5, which is another very common move in the winnower. But after c5, not a3. So the idea of a3, which is the most popular move, is to strengthen the center d4 in exchange you know, for double pawns. And sometimes this bishop is useful along this diagonal. There's been games of Fisher where you know he played a4 later and made use of that dark squared bishop. OK, but here, White doesn't play a3. There's another system, which is the one I remember years ago in my book on Jean Timon by Ravi Kumar. And so Timon, you know, was a, mo a more modern sort of GM later to use this system. Bishop d2. So Bishop d2 is, is showing an interest in basically uh, trying to make use of these dark squares by getting rid of this bishop soon, even at the cost of sacrificing a pawn temporarily. Uh, so Nimzovich replied with knight e7, and now we have it, knight b5. This is the concept. Sacking the d4 pawn, uh, potentially temporarily, in some lines. But here, uh, no sack was needed. Black took on d2, and after queen takes d2, black actually castled. Wants to avoid the knight d6 check. So white has the chance to reinforce d4. He plays c3. So comparing this to the main line uh, winner, white hasn't got the double pawns, but black still has you know, potential dark square issues. D6 and C7 are a bit vulnerable. And they're kind of poked into these dark squares from these pawns here by white pawns. 
So this next move b6 aims either you know to put the bishop here or here is one implication, as well as holding up c5, you know, being able to capture back if needed. White simply played f4, reinforcing the pawn chain, maybe against any potential f6. It's reinforced, and knight f3 could be the reply. Bishop a6, okay. White's knight is reinforced at the moment, so no need to do anything. Knight f3, but now it's attacked again. So what does Alexander do? He reinforces the knight on b5 now with the move a4. Not yet keen to go to d6. After knight bc6, we have a very interesting move now, which later is part of the jigsaw uh, for, for a disaster on the c6 square. White plays now the move b4, which basically aims to share uh, the C file pressure if black dare capture. Uh, so there'll be a shared C file, both sides sharing this C file. Uh, but C6 will be in this game demonstrated to be vulnerable. Black took on B4, C takes B4, so C file shared. Bishop moves back, and then the knight finally goes to D6. So it's eyeing B7. And if b7 is taken, of course c6 is weakened because b7 bishop is protecting c6 at the moment. f5, a bit committal, really. You know, no more f6 uh, from, from black. So white has a free hand, it seems, on the queen side without having to worry too much about the f file. This deeply entrenched knight on the dark square is, is very pretty, uh, but. Are there any exploitable weaknesses? That's another question about the knight. Okay. After a5, we have um, a nasty looking, you know, options like a6 now on the horizon. Nimzovich played knight c8. And the pretty knight is exchanged off now for a more exploitable weakness, which is weakening that c6 square here. It's been subtly weakened. And now after a6, we have a nasty situation for the queen. Wherever it goes, wherever she goes, the knight's going to be pinned. Pinned like that. If she goes here, it could be pinned on the diagonal. So having to defend, um, well, the other option, um, that there are other options. Um, which you know e7 and f7 and b8 so to avoid the nastiness of a pin actually queen f7 was played but we still have pressure now applied to c6 for bishop b5 and it's reinforced white now castles after h6 we see mounting pressure now on the c6 knight with rook fc1 and now uh, a concept later known as the alakine gun some people have joked on chess games com as the triple a battery now when you double rooks there's a coordinated effort of, of your rooks team to intensify pressure somewhere but the alakine's gun is a trebling of you know pressure either like well, on a file, not usually horizontally, um, but uh, usually on a file. And this is the classic game example here of the Alakine gun being used. First, though, uh, the rooks were simply doubled. No big deal there. No special prizes. Um, curiously, by the way, as a side, I had a quadruple pawn game yesterday. I think it's the first time ever. And so this is kind of amusing to see this example of a, a trebling, actually, of pressure. So rook a b8. And this pin is enormous. What can black do to free himself from this pin? Paul Nemzovich here. But what does white do to intensify the pressure? Well, luxuriously, white plays now queen e3, seeing what black will do, testing the water. Black doubles behind the c6, or prepares to double behind c6 with rook c7. 
But now we have the start of the yellow coins gone. Rook C3. So you might think, what? Rook C3, it's making use of C2 now. And if, if this rook can be budged up, then the queen can be put behind. That's the idea. The triple AA battery is emerging here. Queen D7, rook 1 C2, and now the other one comes in. The king comes to the rescue, it seems, for supporting C7. So why would this pressure be harmful? Well, there's another thing about to be unveiled now in this position with this next move, bishop a4. It unveils the idea of b5. So c7 is on the firing line. Against this, black <clears throat> buys some time now by sacking a pawn. Okay, he plays b5 sacking a pawn to bring his king in to support c7. It's looking fairly dire having to lose a pawn like that. The king comes in, but now Alakine realises something about this position, that black is very, very tied up here to that knight on c6, that poor knight on c6, pinned to the queen with that bishop on a4. Oh dear, oh dear. And, okay, um, according to chess games, come the game kind of ended here but some other sources are indicating there was a few more moves so what's happened here is that if black ever moves the king then b5 is actually winning material so black's really stuck for moves and in fact it's it's a major zugzwan I believe the might the game might have carried on uh with a few more moves like h5 king h2 off to g6 g3 and now black is totally you know truly in zugzwang and resigned here it's very very coordinated pressure on c6 with these guys brilliant team effort on c6 there's a team effort to defend c6 and not make it you know such a big deal but it's the compulsion to move which is black's fatal flaw in this position what does black do to avoid losing material now it's the compulsion to move it's zugzwang time as soon as black moves a rook then you know we've got four pieces now against one two three so taking is actually winning material as this demonstrates bang lost material so the rook can't move the king can't move there's no pawn moves left in this position it's zugzwang oh dear <laughs> slightly embarrassing for aaron but uh, in in one of the previous videos in the evolution of style series we did see aaron take a game off alexander but uh, this was one of the unpleasant encounters um as far as pins are concerned, uh, pressure, and Zogswang, pretty nasty stuff. So let's review this again. So trouncing a poor hypermodern Anakine in the French defence, and it's not, it wasn't the last time for Nimzovich to lose in the French defence against Alexander. So knight c3, bishop b4. So the slight controversy is that black's weakening some dark squares. The standard move here is a3. But this was also, you know, is also a popular system. Bishop d2. So knight e7 and now knight b5. So with this system, it seems, you know, there's sometimes quite dangerous pressure on black start squares and d6 is a vulnerable square for even a temporary knight on d6 to cause the accumulation of a particular advantage um, so although it looks pretty what it can do is cause a more exploitable weakness if it's traded off when black tries to parry that knight so the more exploitable weakness was the weakness of the c6 knight 
coming up here. So knight takes b7 is weakening black's control and protection of c6. And black's really stuffed up here on the queen side with this a6 move. So white has a lot more space and freedom. And this b5 is, is a serious threat to consider. So the black queen, you know, fled to f7. Where else? You know, it doesn't want to go in a self pin. So it fled to f7. Now black is really on the back foot. I guess you, you might say, well, you know, maybe knight d8 here. But it's it's giving white, you know, if knight d8, then white just piles it in, you know, with rook c1 and later just infiltrates on c7. Can't give white c7. If white gets c7, it's, it's going to be the end of the game anyway. But it's a very, very difficult position here with, you know, black really destroying, um, pardon me, sorry, it's a very difficult position here with black really having no counterplay on the king side. He's destroyed his king side, king side counterplay. Why is a free hand on the queen side here? This is sometimes evidence in, in these classic games that uh, the modern games are usually, you know, GMs against each other will will avoid positions where they've got no counterplay like the plague. But sometimes in these classic games, you know, um, they play moves like f5, but they don't give themselves much counterplay. They give their opponent a free hand somewhere. With that free hand, you can see luxurious, you know, building up pressure now, as in this game, queen e3. Actually, I remember as a junior, I was watching this Adams game in some open and Adams had a similarly impressive building up of pressure. I think it was on the H file in the French defence, you know, of two ricks and, and maybe even the Queen. Maybe it was an Alakine's gun as well. I was so impressed that you can play chess like that, just building up pressure, building up pressure until the opponent collapses. And this is a vivid demonstration of that. Just the luxury here of being able to treble on that C file. It's, you know, wonderful stuff. So just this rook c3, very cheeky. White has all the space to be able to carry out this tripling operation, creating the triple A battery on the c file. So um, constructing the triple A battery. <laughs> so rook bc8, and now spelling doom for black is this imminent b5, because that's c7 now is under fire after b5. So desperately sacking a pawn to buy time to get the king to protect c7. But um, there's another major problem facing black in this position, uh, which is evident if these, these last moves were played, this h5 and g6, if black did use up the remaining pawn moves, which I believe may be the case, then black probably resigns here in a total Zugzwang. So Zugzwang is is even you know a powerful middle game concept as this game demonstrates, not just reserved for end games. I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, comments or questions on YouTube. Thanks very much.